From the FJC in Washington, D.C., I'm Mark Sherman, and this is Off Paper. In 1986, 17-year-old Clark Porter of St. Louis went on trial in federal court for robbing a post office at gunpoint. He was convicted and sentenced to 35 years in prison. Because the then-new U.S. sentencing guidelines were not yet in force, Clark was released on parole after serving 15 years. Following his release while on parole, Clark took classes at Forest Park Community College and then Washington University. He went on to get his master's degree in social work at the University of Missouri-St. Louis, and for the past 11 years, Clark has been the community resources specialist for the U.S. Probation Office in the Eastern District of Missouri, the very same office that recommended his 35-year prison sentence to the court and the very same office that supervised him on parole. In this episode of Off Paper, I'll talk with Clark Porter about his life before and after his conviction, how he ended up working for U.S. probation, and what it's like to now be assisting people who are in the same position he was in not too long ago, folks who are leaving federal prison and re-entering the community on supervised release. So we've got an ex-felon turned social worker turned federal court staff member in the house today, folks. Sound crazy? Well, it is sort of crazy. Crazy good. Clark Porter, welcome to Off Paper. How are you doing? Thanks so much for being here. Uh, you know, so I want to begin by asking you what your life was like before you were arrested at 17 on the post office robbery charge, and what were some of the things that were happening uh, in your life at that time? I know it was a, a while ago, uh, but if you could tell us some of the things that were happening in your life at the time and how you ended up getting involved in the robbery. Well, I've... I basically was a typical uh, social service uh, project, uh, if you will. I started off in the foster care system from the age of 4 to 15 due to severe neglect. And uh, my father was an alcoholic. Uh, and my mother, she was illiterate. She couldn't read or write. And she had a limited intellectual, intellectual capacity. So that's what ended us up in the system. Doing while I was in the system, it was more the same of abuse and neglect. And then I aged at, at the age of 15, I just was tired of the system, so I basically walked off from a group home and ended up on the streets. And so my sister took, gave me the, 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 the rough and raw of it. She said, you ain't got the two choices. You either going to hustle or go to school. Which one is it? And school wasn't an option for me because it was like I needed to put food in my mouth, literally. So I started hustling, doing petty things. I um, ended up meeting my co-defendant when I was about 16. And I was just fascinated with him. I mean, he had a pocket full of money. He always kept a gun. And he had him a hustle. You know, and so when I, I kind of latched on to him and ended up in the Division of Youth Services for some uh for some uh, what we called boosting back then, uh, isotonic gloves. And I did a stint in there, got back out, and then me, him, he and I got back together again, and my situation was just as dire as it was when we first met one another. And he was like, hey, I do robberies, you want to go do some? And I started off uh, doing small things, and then it escalated into the robbery of the post office. So you, you were 17 years old and being tried as an adult in federal court and, you know, sort of moving a, a little bit uh, fast forward through that. When you found out that you would be sentenced to 35 years in prison, what was that like? I needed a cigarette <laughs> <laughs> because it wasn't real to me. Sure. And, you know, I was going to trial just, cause, just because it was, it was just an option. And after uh, Judge uh, James Myers, you know, you know, hit the gavel and said 35 years, that's when I realized I had 35 years, and I, and I understood the magnitude of it then. But during the process, I didn't understand what was going on. I didn't even understand the proceedings half of the time. Right, right. So there you are. You're slapped with a 35-year prison sentence. You're 17 years old, uh, basically being tried as an adult in federal court uh, and convicted. So you, you go off to the BOP. 
and, and what was that like for you? What were some of the things you remember? At what point, uh, for example, did you make a decision uh, that you wanted to get back in school and, and go to college? I mean, that seems like a big leap for somebody like yourself who was coming from where you were coming from. Well, college wasn't the idea. It was more something that was kind of just came about. And it came about two ways. One, I had a guy, his name was uh, Porkchop. He was, he, was, he was about to leave and go home. He was uh, he was pretty much was doing life on the installment plan. And he said, man, you ain't doing nothing else. Why don't you go get your GED? I said, I can get my GED. I don't want to be bothered with it. And he said, I bet you $10 you can't get that GED. And so I went up there and I took the uh, tape test and passed it. And they said, what you want to do? I said, I'll go ahead and take the GED. And I started and it was like a week later, I got called from the Unicor factory by the teacher. And he said, I just need another body to sit in here and take the GED test. You want to do it? And I was like, yeah, I guess I'll do it. And I flunked it by uh, point, four points or something of that nature. And he was like, hey, take it again. We got another one coming up. And he said, take the whole thing because they average you, uh, your score out. So I took it and I passed it. Uh, as far as college goes, it was more of a something to do with in prison the past time, but I wasn't committed to it. It wasn't real to me. When I this was when I was at FCI Oxford. It wasn't until I went to uh, Leavenworth that it became real to me, and I started focusing on really trying to do something with it. When you say that it became real to you, I, so you ended up, uh, you, you were transferred to Leavenworth. It, you, it became real to you at that time. So what was happening just sort of in your own mind that sort of enabled it to become real to you? The people I was around. Uh-huh. Because back then when you said a federal, when you said when you, when you did federal time, you were federal. I mean, most of them were highly intelligent. Most of them were very sophisticated criminals. Most of them ran large organizations. These were the type of criminals. You had Michael Milken types. You had the Bernie Madoffs. You had uh, John Gotti. Uh, you, you know, you had real live terrorists with real uh, world views on how they thought the world should be ran. So these were the type of guys I was around. And so they were so... The past time in prison was, hey, Clark, here's a book, and the book would be on something like Tolstoy. It would be on uh, the Manifesto of the Communist Party. Uh, you know, these are the books they were giving me, Walter Rodney, uh, the undevelopment of uh, how Europe underdeveloped Africa. So, you know, all these, uh, it was like a think tank. Hmm. So it was like in order to be a part of the think tank, you had to, you had to pursue uh, intellect. So that's how I ended up going back to college and doing well in Leavenworth. I'm very interested to know sort of about the next step, because the next step eventually, at least, was returning to the community. Uh, You ended up doing uh, around 15 years. Uh, That's a long time uh, to be outside of the community. You got your three hots in a cot. You know, you've got basically your whole life is programmed, as you know, while you're in prison. You know, so 15 years later, uh, you're returning back to the community. What was the hardest part for you? I was apathetic Mm -hmm. about being back. What I mean by that is, whereas let's say someone who's been gone 10, 15 years, they're fascinated by, you know, the Dairy Queen is no longer there and it now has an apartment building. Those things, you know, it's kind of like, I. was in den- not apathetic, but I was in denial about how long I had did in prison. I think that was more of a of a defense mechanism mechanism to get me through it because I didn't really look at the magnitude of how long I had been gone. My focus was on I'm out. I'm, I got to start executing the plan because no one is going to feed me or provide for me. I had to stand up on my own. I had to take responsibility for my life. So that was my whole focus. Rebuilding. It was not on, you know, let me go find a date, let me go find, you know, all the fellas I left behind. It was never, it was never about that. 
And as you were uh, sort of transitioning into the community, at some point, obviously, you reported to U.S. probation. You had to start your uh, your parole term. And I wonder what that was like for you, um, just in terms of, you know, starting that supervision process, meeting your PO, how that relationship uh, started out to, you know, how did it evolve or did it evolve over time? be honest with you, I had expectations of what a P.O. was. Right. And those expectations were, I'm going to see a white guy from rural America trying to tell me about life and how to live life. And my attitude was basically going to be, if I had got that law enforcement uh, pushback from him, my attitude would have been a F you. Mm-hmm. Plain and simple. I mean, it's no other way to say it, you know, because that's what we was used to that uh, cops and robber relationships of all my life I was dealing with the system and I wasn't expecting any support or any help but when I but, but what ended up happening is I ended up with a probation officer African American looked just like me he came from the same community as me and understood the same struggles that I and understood my struggles and I think to Chief Burr's credit is that he it wasn't just about the diver- and let me just think for this state that it wasn't about just the diversity in terms of skin color, race, gender. It was more about the diversity of ideas that he interjected into the agency. So when I met this guy, he was all about rehabilitation. He was all about finding a way. And he made a comment the other day, uh, which was Troy Stewart was my probation officer. He made a comment that you always got to make it, put the onus back on the offender, meaning that what is it that you want for yourself? Not what I, as a probation officer, want. What do you want for yourself? And that's the approach he always took with me. And, and, and it just so happened that it worked for me. Is that how you ended up deciding to uh, pursue uh, community college? Is it, was it the support, in part at least, that you were receiving from and the encouragement you were receiving from your PL? Yeah, because... It was a dis- it really was a discussion with him, and he said, and the first thing he said, well, you know, you gotta make some changes. Starting with cutting your hair, starting with you know letting go of the prison mentality, and you're gonna have to humble yourself to a lot of things out here. And I was like, I'm, I ain't gonna do that, I ain't gonna do that, and I ain't gonna do that. I'm gonna be me, I'm gonna keep it real. And he's like, okay, so he let me do my own thing. He allowed child or error to take place. So when I got into community college, I realized, man, I'm not in prison no more. You can't get upset when someone bumps you. Man, you know, I got these long dreadlocks. It's not allowing me, even though it's kind of a trend now, it still limits people. So I, so I said, okay, it's time to cut the dreadlocks. It's time to have that white bread look of khaki pants, polo shirt. And casual dress shoes, and I started taking on that uh, approach and attitude, and I allowed myself to be criticized by well-meaning people, and I learned along the way. Because you talking about somebody being gone, I was my development stopped at 17 years old, right. and I walked out at 32, but I still had a man of 17 year old. Right, right. So, so one of the things I want to ask you also is, you know, uh, because as you know, um, based on the work that you do, and certainly in, uh, I have observed uh, over the many years that I've been doing the work that I do, is it's very difficult for somebody who's returning to the community to extricate themselves from um, from. You know, you know, sort of the, yeah, you know, the bad influences back in the hood. And I'm wondering, you know, how you were able to navigate uh, uh, around that to not get sucked back into it. Well, and this is no not, but the halfway house is located right on the, right on the, right on the, uh, the stroke. Mm-hmm. You know, you got your drug dealers in the neighborhood. You got the drug dealers in the halfway house. You're not going to avoid it. <clears throat> but what it did teach me is that you can be in it but not of it, or vice versa. And what I mean by that is when I got my first apartment, it was $295, and it was right on the corner of Goodfellow and Claire where they sold dope outside my apartment. So I could be either in it or of it. So my thing was... 
I got up in the morning and work, worked out, and I was on the bus at 7 o'clock. At the school at 8 o'clock, spent my all day there. Then I went from there to work, back home by 11 o'clock. And that's how both my routine. I was not a part of the community. I lived in the community. And that's what I say for a lot of guys, just because of where you come from doesn't matter. You know, guys have to start doing things that are more pro-social in nature until they can get a grip on where they're at because their social environment is standing on the corner smoking a joint. Now they had to learn how to go to the uh, art museum and look at art or go play handball on the handball court with guys who are doctors and lawyers. So uh, how on earth did you end up working with U.S. probation in St. Louis? A combination of my probation officer <laughs> and uh, Doug Burris. <clears throat> because they, uh, I met with my probation officer up at the school for some event up at the, when I was at home for graduating. And he said, what do you want to do? I said, I'm thinking about working with uh, juvenile offenders. He said, no, I don't do that. He said, you got to get the 25-year-old. He said, you got to get them between 18 and 25. He said, work with them. He said, work with adult offenders. I'm like, I ain't trying to do that. He said, I'm telling you, work with adult offenders. You have more success than you have with the juveniles because they're not ready to hear it yet. So anyway, fast forward, I was working with a uh, college-bound, uh, uh, doing a cognitive uh, group with the students. And no, I was volunteering with uh What's the name of the place? Uh, uh, it was a place on uh, Project Hope where they provided housing to ex-offenders, and they needed another person to do a training. Uh, on a, I think training was a, uh, what is it? It's a two-day training, a miniature training of OWDS. I forgot the name of it. Uh, I think it's OES, Offender Employment Specialist Training. Right, right, that yes. yeah. So anyway. Uh, I needed a job when I was graduating. And I was looking and looking, I got interviews and no jobs. And I saw Quincy Thomas' name on the card that says employment specialist. So I called him and said, let me drop my card off to you and see if you get my resume off to me, to you. And if you find anything, let me know. So he said, sure. So when I dropped the resume off to him, I decided to get Chief one as well because he had got me employed with employment, uh, Connection to success, a nonprofit organization. Mm -hmm. So I figured, hey, if you got me there, you may even find another place for me. And then it, when I was, uh, the next day, it was a Saturday, I'm working with the college bound kid, and I get a, I see a 244 number. I'm like, what the you call me? He said, I said, it must be chief. And he said, where are you trying to work? I said, right now, I had him laugh for juvenile offenders, but I'm open right now. He said, come see me Monday. And then he offered me uh, a part-time position. He said, I'm going to offer you a part-time. And I was willing to take you. I said, <clears throat> because it's like, it's like he's racing your record, saying you were federal probation. I said, okay, I'll take that. Just, you know. And he said, give me time. And then later on, he said, uh, me and Joe Jackson talked, and we decided we're just going to bring you on. Mm. So that's how it happened. Wow. So, uh, and this is after you had graduated from social work school, is that correct? Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, so, um, n I'm, my next question is really about how the staff in U.S. probation reacted uh, to having you as a colleague at the very beginning. Frustration and fear. You know, because, you know, uh, I think the frustration was, was how did he deserve his job? Mm. And the fear was, you know, is he still an ex-offender? You know, is he, does he still have that prison mentality? And then I think my biggest adversary was uh, the marshal service. Because, you know, they, you know uh, they would not, I didn't have a badge for a year. I had to go to the metal detector. I only badge, my badge only worked at the probation office. And they came down and explained to me, you will never have a badge for this building because you are an ex-offender. And my response was, because it was 2000 now, so I got a job in an economy that's not hiring. I'm not worried about the badge. I can deal with it. And so, um, so I had those three things against me, you know, the fear of the office, the, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the anger about me being hired, and then battling with the marshals, and it's, and then nobody know what to do, knew what to do with me because.
uh, the physician was a new physician uh, with all the districts. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, just, and, you know, and uh, and what I did was does allow me to make the position what, what I wanted to make it. Him and Scott both. So what I did was started creating. I never allowed anyone to tell me what I couldn't do. Uh, they would say, well, can he drop? I, I, I live by, is that better to ask for forgiveness later? So I was doing drops. So, you know, and everybody's like, he been doing, he's doing drops. Yeah, I've been doing it for about a month now. He just now figured it out. And so those are things that I did to get myself integrated. And I started creating programs with uh, Lisa White from mentoring to intensive supervision and other things. Obviously, you've been there now for, I guess, 10, 11 years, so things have evolved uh, for you. Um, and, and, and so how, how have things changed uh, since those early years? I mean, at first it must have just been weird for everybody. Uh, yeah. how, how have things evolved for you uh, in the department since those early years? Good and bad because they trust my judgment. Bad because they think I know everything. <laughs> yeah, because it's like as far as it relates to community service uh, resources, because it's like you know people come to me and say, "How do I get this guy medical coverage?" I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, where you get housing? I don't know. Mm-hmm. You know, but for the most part, I do know my role and my position, and I and uh. I'm very involved with a lot of things, and I'm very abreast of a lot of things that I stay, you know, aware of what goes on to take place in the community. So sometimes people kind of, I guess, take it for granted that I'm supposed to know everything because, you know, I, I'm, I'm well uh, informed about a lot of things. So it's kind of like, if you don't know, I guess it don't exist or it's not possible. So, you know, I get a lot of people coming into those scenarios and they ask me, you know, what can they do? And for the most part, I can give them an answer. And then at times I can't. And, I, and I'll admit, I'm like, I have no idea how to do that. You know, you might have to look up, look, you, know, you know, not to be funny, but you might have to look it up in a phone book or something of that nature. And it sounds like one thing that hasn't changed for you uh, has been the support that you've gotten from your chiefs. And first, you had mentioned Doug Burris, and yeah. now uh, his successor, Scott Anders, yeah. uh, are, are are big supporters of you. And I, I suspect that that has been fairly constant over the years. Oh, yeah. It's still a lot. Yeah, because I think in my position, like I said, it's still, even though it's, to my knowledge, I know the community resource special position is at least 10 or 12 years old. Mm-hmm. And I still get calls, and I still hear, you know, through rumor mills, well, they don't allow me to work directly with offenders. They don't allow me to uh, do this. I have to do that. And it's their hands, you know, they're hampered. Whereas, you know, with Scott and Doug, they was like, here's a job, here's a computer, figure it out. Mm-hmm. You know, and we'll assist you along the way, but pretty much you got to figure it out and find your way. And it wasn't in a in a rough-handed way. Is that the position is new to us to create it and make it what you want to make it. You know, so my focus is always been both reentry. You know, I'm heavy on reentry. I'm heavy on education. I'm heavy on training. And they allow me to do that, and then they allow me to do other things, and then it become a thing. Whereas uh, it's about now you, you you just another person in the office, and I don't mean that as a criticism, but you really are. You're just another person in the office. You're not the ex convict. You're not the, the community resource specialist who uh, don't know the job. You're just another person in the office, and you got to go by the same rules, which is do more with less. I hear that a lot. Clark Porter, a social worker and community resources specialist with the Eastern District of Missouri's U.S. Probation Office, is my guest. When we come back, I'll ask Clark to delve more deeply into the challenges faced by reentering citizens and about the programs and resources he has developed and used to assist some of the highest-risk people on supervised release. You're listening to Off Paper. Hi, I'm Lori Murphy, a colleague of Mark Sherman and head of the Executive Education Group at the FJC. We have a podcast that focuses on leadership in the federal courts called In Session, Leading the Judiciary, that I think you'll like. 
Each episode features current research and cutting edge insights into leadership. Guests include Michael Lewis, groundbreaking author of The Undoing Project and Moneyball, Professor Jennifer Eberhardt, implicit bias researcher at Stanford University, and Harvard Business School's expert on psychological safety, Amy Edmondson. Each episode strives to enhance listeners' critical thinking skills, encourage expression of authentic leadership, and promote the use of best practices among judiciary executives. Episodes are available wherever you get your podcasts or on fjc.dcn. Join us. The podcast is In Session, Leading the Judiciary. Welcome back. Clark, I want to take some time here and ask you to go a bit more deeply into discussing the challenges faced by people who are reentering the community from prison. So first, maybe talk about when, in your opinion, reentry begins and what happens from there. Ideally, you want reentry to begin from the first day you walk out, but that's not realistic for most people because they're not looking at what's ahead for most guys coming out. So typically a guy, he starts... Uh, looking towards reentry six months to a year from getting out. And the problem, and which is the problem is, that's not enough time for him to process what's going to take place. So when guys typically get out, they make all these pledges and promises to themselves, to their family. But when that door open, it's like they're off and running. And they're not focused. And that's what the problem is for most of them. They don't get, they don't get focused. And then, once, and then if they have an addiction, they start falling back into those same patterns, same routine, and they go back to the same community and they look up the same friends, and then they're right back in that cycle again. So they don't know how to remove themselves from those environments, remove themselves from those friends. I mean, because even though you say change people, places, and things, that's not an easy process. And I'll explain that to you later as to why it's not an easy process. I'll explain to you now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, let's talk about it now. Uh, And and it sort of goes back to the question I had asked you earlier, just about your own experience and about how you did not get reinvolved in, you know, going when you went back to the neighborhood and you had said you have to, you know, you can either be in the com- community or of the community and you said you were living in the community but you did not feel that you were of the community. So, uh, let's talk about it now. For me, I had I made the decision that I wasn't going back. Mm-hmm. So that was, that was step 1. Step 2 was I had to do I had to replace it with things realistically. So I immersed myself in education, and I did the same thing that I did in prison. I programmed. My program was I got up in the morning at 5 o'clock. I worked out. I was on the bus by 7 o'clock. I was at the school by 8 o'clock, and that's why I stayed until my class started at 9 o'clock. That was my routine. I did everything to keep myself away, and along the way, I developed new relationships. And then I never opened up old doors, meaning that I never I didn't look up anybody. If I happen to see somebody that I knew from years ago, hey man, how you doing? Let me have your number. They get the wrong number, or they wouldn't get my number at all. So those are the things that I did to protect myself, and I kept myself in the structured environment with everything I did. And the minute I wanted to get high, I found a way to replace it. In, in my case, I started volunteering a lot within the community. Started off with food, uh, working at food pantries with the Urban League, to becoming a member of Court Appointed Special Advocates for Abuse and Neglected Children with St. Louis County. And then I did a host of other things along the way, so I stayed constant. And then I learned you can pad your resume with these volunteer jobs and have great references as well as give back to the community. So at the end of the day, when you ask me, uh, uh, what did I do to make the change? I, you know, it, I made myself a part of the community. That's what I would say, rather than allow myself to exist on the margins of the community. Mm-hmm. And so that's, uh, that sounds extraordinarily difficult to do, and I suspect that um, that, that, that you, I mean, and in your work now, I mean, you are tr- sort of helping folks navigate that, and, and, I, mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm going back to that issue of when reentry begins and that folks, in your opinions, don't start thinking about it until it's sort of too late. Mm-hmm. Um, so so uh, how do you, you know, you're getting folks when, they're, when they are uh, starting supervision 
though, uh, you know, there may, I'm curious to know what techniques you use uh, with folks who are reentering the community so that they can st- try to navigate uh, the community and uh, re-enter, re- reentry uh, as you did. First thing I do, I do, I do the things that were either done for me or weren't, or weren't, weren't done for me. Mm-hmm. For the thing that was done for me, uh, that was a a form. They used to give us free books. I think it was left banks or someone. Or someone used to send free books to prison. The only thing you do is write them, and you just tell them the topic, and they'll send you a book close to what you wanted. But one day they sent me a couple of books, and they had a form that say they said send twenty five dollars, and we will send you a list of resources in your area. So I asked my aunt, I said, hey, can you do this for me and pay for this? And she said, okay. And so when I got the form back, <laughs> when I got the information back, it was everything I asked for, mental health, uh, going to college, uh, you know, substance abuse, uh, medical care. It gave, gave me a whole several pages of addresses to write. And so I started a writing campaign. I, you know, I wrote Wash U, I wrote uh, Umsel, I wrote uh, Community College. And I started my writing campaign getting information from these places on on services that I need when I get out. So when I came here to work with the probation office, I said, that's something that is needed. So I said, how can I do that? So what we did was I got together with, uh, with the employment specialist, which is Quincy, mm-hmm. and... Uh, uh, people who uh, who specialize in different things and we created a, a form. And that form asks you about your educational background. It asks you, do you want to go to tra- uh, train or education? It asks you, what are your needs are from medical to dental to housing? And you check off. All you do is check it off and put it in the mail, address it to me. And those things that you ask for are what you would get in the mail from me. So if you ask for a two-year college, and you, you live in Cape Girardeau, I found it to you a colleague in Cape Girardeau, and I sent it to you. You know, uh, if you ask for medical and dental and you're in the St. Louis City or county area, I get as close to your area that you live and send you that information. Those are, those are some of the things we do with reentry. You've been doing the work for about 11 years, and you're on the front lines. You're working with both returning citizens and their POs. You're sort of, um, you know, sort of helping to negotiate that relationship. I think our audience would really be interested to know what the outcomes have been for particular types of programs and for folks on probation and supervised release in terms of their specific needs. So, I mean, based on your experience, what types of programs and resources that you've developed and used, just like the one that you've described, you know, have worked well, you know, but also what, what hasn't worked so well? Oh, sadly, uh, the programs we develop for, uh, for the crack releases and for, I think after the crack releases, it was still, what was it? Uh, what was that number, 828? Uh, 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 yes, yes. I want to say 742, but I could yeah, be wrong about I that. Think, yeah, I think, yeah, that group of guys, mm-hmm. because these guys were basically, they, they were career-based criminals. I mean, I'm just lack of a better term. Mm-hmm. You know, they were too rooted in their criminal behavior and thinking. So when they got out on the crack release, you just said, no, okay, these guys are going to get it together. And systematically, all of them, with the exception of two, we started off with a group of 20. And all of them either re- revoked, reoffended, whatever, with the exception of two. Three, I, I take it three. Uh, and of those three, they all, those three had in common is they went back and got retrained. They found career jobs. Uh, they started their own, and then two of them started their own businesses. You know, and they're still out here, they're still doing well, all three of them. But the rest can't say that. You know, they just couldn't get around being so, uh, I guess, in that criminal thinking and behavior. They couldn't get, they couldn't get past it. So they ultimately became failures. <clears throat> Some of our biggest successes, which, uh, Surprisingly, we look at the numbers, not our numbers, but the numbers from the uh, data that's out there in the, in the, uh, 
in the community is with family visits. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, each year, uh, Caritas and the Greek Orthodox community get together and they fund a free trip to the federal prison, which is, uh, and most of the time we go to Leavenworth, we'll pay for the hotel, pay for the bus, pay for all food expenses, bring food into the institution and just do family visits and programming. And with the, of all, just, I haven't ran the numbers on everybody or looked them up, but to my knowledge, only one person been revoked under a new charge. You know, the rest of them, they either still in waiting to get out, or and the other half are out and doing well. You know, and some of them have done their family visit two or three times with us. And then the, the data on that shows that the more visits they got, the less likely they're to come back. Mm. So it's been going really good with that. And then we have a couple other things uh, for the uh, CDL training that we do on a second chance. So that's the commercial driver's license program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Guys get employed yep. in spite of their records. You know, we go before the judge and advocate for them to get the blanket travel from here. And, you know, they're off and running. And you, know, and you don't hear from those guys except for when they need a drug test mm -hmm. or they need something from you. They're living their life. And one of them, I'm especially proud of, I think it's, um, I'm trying to remember his last name. He was one of the, I think his, his, name, his name was Mark. And this guy, he got out of prison. That's all he talked about was trying to be a CDL driver. Mm -hmm. And we got him in. And they said, well, no, he called, called one. I said, man, I haven't heard from you. How you doing? He said, I'm down here in Florida. Now I live down here in you know, I got a bank account. I did everything you said. I got my bank account with the credit union. I did this. I did that. I cleaned up my credit. And now I'm finna buy a house in a couple more weeks. And you're like, wow. <laughs> you know, but I think the thing that fascinates me the most is not the guy that's sitting in the front row listening. It's the guy when you're walking down the street, going to the Walmart and say, man, I remember you from Liverpool when you came up there. I did everything you said. And I cannot remember his name. Mm. And I'm like, I didn't even know he was in the, in the crowd. So the people you least expect to to uh, succeed are are often those who actually do. Yeah, 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 it's interesting. Hey, so I wanna I wanna ask you, Clark. You know, the the two most difficult aspects of reentry for returning citizens in our in our system um, are when returning folks have to make the transition from a BOP facility to a residential reentry center or halfway house, and then again when they have to transition uh, from the halfway house to supervision. Um, and you've been doing a lot of work on your district on what's called inreach with the Bureau of Prisons, uh -huh. um, and you know, and that's in order to improve how the agencies work together and hopefully get folks thinking about reentry before um, you know before they get out. Um, so, you know, describe what some of that some of that work is like. Well, uh, we've been fortunate that you know, particularly with Scott. He's always pushed for cognitive therapy mm -hmm. within the prison before the guys get out. And we've been fortunate <clears throat> that we have Greenville as close as we do. Uh, it's like 45 minutes away. Mm -hmm. And once a week, we go there and we do a trauma-based therapy uh, using the MRT model. And uh, we do it for eight weeks. Then we take a break for like a week. Then we're back at it. So all year round, we're constantly running the trauma-based therapy with these guys. But we're not just doing the therapy. We're also doing things like, you know, hey, what do you need? Well, I need uh, information on housing. or I need to get a child support resolved. So we're doing these triage things as we're doing the cognitive uh, stuff with them. So you're going, in, you're going into the institution, into the BOP institution, and you're doing this work. So this is well before that... The but well before they're released, then. Right. Uh huh. She usually, which is a judge for greater reentry affairs coordinator, mm -hmm. she usually give them to me six months to two years of release. Mm. Uh, and, and she makes it mandatory for them. I told her, well, these volunteers. She said, no, I ain't volunteers. It's mandatory. And so she, uh, and so she calls them out of the units, both St. Louis guys, uh, Illinois guys and whatever other guys that she identifies who needs it. And we just, and it's three of us, well, 
within the office that goes to the prison constantly. And just work with these guys. We go to the men's side, then we go to the women's side. And we do the same. We do it and we repeat it. Until the six weeks are up, uh, we meet guys at the halfway house. Uh, uh, the officers, uh, one of the officers is in charge of assigning cases. So what he'll do is he'll send me the guys who are there or about to come to the halfway house. We'll work with the halfway house and have them hold with those guys for a weekend, for a Saturday, for an hour. And we go in there and we provide them with community resources on training, education, how to get their social security cards, how to get their ID. And then we'll, then we'll go with the general committee orders with them, have them sign all of their necessary paperwork, and we're out of there. And, uh, so, so they, and that's for the person giving an introduction to us, but also getting some of the paperwork done. So when they come out, they're not sitting in all three or four hours trying to get some things resolved before they can start with their life. So have you found, Clark, that um, the in-reach work that you're doing by going in and doing the programs uh, at the institution and working more closely with the halfway house, have you found that that has sort of eased uh, the transition onto supervision for folks? Yeah, it took away the fear. Right. Because uh, what I mean when it takes away the fear is that if I'm constantly seeing a Troy Stewart or Lisa White or Quincy Sound, and I constantly see these faces and names. These are these are uh, probation officer colleagues right. of yours. These right? probation officers mm-hmm. are not this. If I constantly see these faces, people's name and faces, then I know who to ask to when I get ask for when I get in trouble. Mm-hmm. And I'm not talking about trouble where I don't drop dirty. I'm talking about, you know, I can't make rent. I'm about to be homeless. Right. Um, things like that, they'll come to you quicker. Because for one while, for for like a year, uh, some of the people I named, they went to the prisons once a month for, for, for various reasons. Quincy, he, he handled uh, all the employment educational stuff. I handled all the resources. Another probation officer handled all the uh, family issues that are going on outside of the prison that the inmates can't handle. And so it got to the point they knew us by faith. So when they got out of the prison, the probation officer might have been uh, um, uh, Joe Smith, but they asked him for Quincy Fountain because they know what he specialized in. And they asked for him specifically because he knows how, and they know that he knows how to address their needs. It's that collaboration that's taking place. I'm talking with Clark Porter of the United States Probation Office in the Eastern District of Missouri, which covers St. Louis and the entire eastern portion of the state. After a short break, we'll wrap up with a discussion about how the work Clark is doing corresponds with evidence-based practice in U.S. probation and some program areas he'd like to address better. This is Off Paper. In 2017, FJC Probation in Pretrial Services Education introduced 10 competencies for experienced U.S. probation and pretrial services officers. Each competency contains a definition, a set of accompanying behaviors, and an outcome that describes what the competency looks like in action. To assist officers in furthering their professional development, The FJC recently created the Experienced Officer Competencies Toolkit. The toolkit includes links to the Charter for Excellence, the competencies for experienced U.S. probation and pretrial services officers, a self-assessment, a professional development plan, and FJC programs and resources for experienced probation and pretrial services officers. The self-assessment and professional development plan are fillable PDFs, meaning you can download, complete, and save the form on your computer or device. The toolkit also includes brief videos designed to help officers deepen their appreciation of the connection between excellence, as envisioned by the Charter, and the competencies. The videos can be streamed or downloaded for use at training events, meetings, district retreats, and the like. The Experienced Officers' Competencies Toolkit can be found by clicking on the Education Menu tab on the FJC.DCN homepage and then clicking on Probation and Pretrial Services Education. Clark, as you know, for the past 10 years or so, pretty much for the entire time you've been working with U.S. Probation, the system has been emphasizing the use of evidence-based practices, 
specifically in the area of post-conviction supervision, which is the subject matter area you and your colleagues focus on. The primary emphasis has been on using actuarial risk and needs assessments with each returning citizen so that his or her risk of recidivism can be determined as well as his or her most pressing areas of need. Then the probation officer can develop a case plan to address all of that by using core correctional practices that are specifically designed to help returning folks do so successfully. The framework used by officers is referred to as risk, need, and responsivity, and I suspect that the work that you do really comes into play in terms of responsivity, where probation really needs to adapt to the situation of the client in order to be most helpful. So can you describe specifically how your work as a community resources specialist fits with the risk, needs, responsivity model of supervision? Well, I mean, um, if you look at mass laws, hierarchy, and need, mm-hmm. Uh, you're supposed to have this, you know, this trajectory up that, up, up that stratification like level, to where now you reach your self-actualization. But how can you even come close to reach your self-actualization when you can't even do the basic things of food, clothes, and shelter? That's where we're at with most of these guys, and so we focus on getting them beyond food, clothing, and shelter because right now they're mostly in survival mode. And that's all they ever been doing. And it's not so much as a comfort there, but it's a familiarity there. So you got to get a move beyond that. And as a reach community resource person, if I could do something to relieve a burden such as uh, get a guy a bed, uh, help a guy pay for his uh, 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 tooth uh, tooth and get it pulled, things like that, now you can get some buy-in from them. Whereas before, it was all about, you're going to do as I say, and you go, and yeah, I'm going to crack the whip if you don't, and I want to revoke. Because back when my early days of supervision, not so much mine, but when I was in the system, I would see a guy one day, he's back in prison 30 days. Because he had three dirty drops, he's out, three and out. Now they understand that that's not the solution because he's still an addict when you get through sending them back for three dirty drops. So now you have to work with them. And so the thing of it is is that you have to start finding out what's going on with them first to cause them to even get high in the first place. Then you start finding out things. So you got to come from behind that desk and you got to say, what is wrong? What do you need? As opposed to, you know, judgment and commitment order says you're not supposed to drop dirty, you're not supposed to, you have to have that for illegal use of drugs. You know, don't nobody want to hear that when I got other issues going on. And my issue is, I might not be able to read it right. My issue is, I got a daughter who's on who's on a uh, who's on a deathbed, and I don't have any medical coverage for her. So real life hits people, just like real life hits you and I. But we're more functional that we can deal with. It. We got medical coverage, or we can go into the four hundred one k and resolve it, or we can ask a family member. We have resources and different things going for us. Because we are, we are functional in our society. These guys aren't. You're taking the guy from the beginning. You know, at 35 years old, 40 years old, he's beginning his life after being incarcerated 10 years. That's not an easy process. Because it's easy for you, if you lose your job right now and do the layoff, to go out and get a job. But how about if I take you, the same individual, that used to living in a suburban lifestyle, with, you know, uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a career job and say, I'm going to take all that from you, now go sell some dope and get back. How successful do you think you're going to be? Whereas the same thing goes for you guys. You take the dope away from it and say, go out there and maintain society and make it work. This is rugged individualism. It's not going to work. Yes, yeah, give them his tools. Yeah, so I think that's um, really uh, an important uh, way of thinking about this because in order for, um, I guess, the the way that uh, we do supervision now in the federal system, in order for in order for it to be as effective as it can be, uh, folks need to get those basic needs met first. I guess is what you're saying. 
Right. And that's kind of where you come in um, to, to sort of help them meet those needs so that the actual core correctional practices, you know, can, can actually have their intended effect. Is that fair? Right. And I think uh, the mission of this office is, is what's always driven me, and I mean that quite literally, mm-hmm. because the mission of the office for the United States Probation Office of the Eastern District of Missouri was the District Court Administration of Justice, uh, facilitating the curious process of long-term positive change for those under our supervision and contribute to a safer community. The facilitation long-term facilitate and encourage long-term change is where I'm stuck at. It's where my focus is. Because if I can facilitate, not tell you to change, not direct you to change, but facilitate it. And so sometimes I, I'm okay with having a base practice. But my social worker and me said, meet them where they're at. Then start working with them. But if we don't meet them where they're at and we just tell them what we want, that's not going to help them. The reason it's not going to help them because that's not what they want. You want him to go and excel and go to Harvard. He's just trying to make it through community college first. Everything else will fall in play after that. And he's just trying to get a bus token so that he can get to the community college, right? Exactly. I mean, I mean this is sort of um, where I, I, I wanted this conversation to go with you because there is sort of the uh, the ideal, the evidence-based ideal in terms of how we want to assess and supervise people, and I think that's obviously an important part of our system, a central part of it our is. system, and we need to to do that. But there's also you've got to meet the client where they are, as you say, and you've got to get them to the point where they can actually be responsive to those evidence-based practices, right? Exactly. So one of the things I wanted to ask you, Clark, because there's been some a degree of inconsistency across our system. Uh, it's a large system. We are from sea to shining sea, plus all the territories in the federal system. And there's been some inconsistency within the districts about, for example, the use of the Second, Second Chance Act funds, right? Mm-hmm. This is an area where you have expertise because – Those funds can be used to fund community resources to get people reentering the community to the point where they can um, get their basic needs met. So Mm -hmm. talk about how you all have been using some – your second chance funds and uh, just any advice you might have for how those funds could be used by other districts. Why we use our second chance fund is is primarily for training, emergency needs – uh, and employment-based needs. So we focus on those three areas. Uh, emergency need guy, you know, doesn't have any money to get his tooth pulled and all the cost of 75 bucks, we'll do that. You know, uh, a guy, he, he's got a job, a great job, but he wants to have $300 worth of tools. And he doesn't have a job, and he barely got enough money for a bus for to get there. So we resolve, we get your bus pass. We get you three hundred dollars of tools, and we send you out there because it's the small things that matter more than the big things. We look, we it just kind of remind me of my of my uh, parish. You know, they want to raise fifty thousand dollars to to, to 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 help someone when sometimes five hundred dollars is just as effective as 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 five as fifty thousand dollars. And we've come to understand that if we can get these guys trained with, let's say, $5,000, and we can put them on a, uh, what do you call it, a, a CDL truck and send them on his way, and all it cost us $2,500 to pay for his CDL uh, license and instructions, we got a success. Because we don't have to worry about him coming back no more because he's got a way to feed himself and he's got a career job. And he's got, and he's got benefits. As opposed to saying... Uh, taking a second chance fund, we're going to put it in all in the drug treatment. Yeah, drug treatment is all right, but son, I'm just being honest with you. Eh, I'm not a big fan of how we do drug treatment because sometimes we just take what the community offers. Well, I can offer you the lowest, and I can just filter them through, and we're done with them. We say we give them drug treatment. You know, you know I'm, I'm, I'm more down with the Betty Ford process, even though we can't afford it. You know, so those are things I look at, and I think many of us in the office look at if we can get these guys educated, 
either a post-secondary education or a viable training that's going to get them beyond that minimum wage. We don't have to worry about them no more. They're all going to succeed. We just got to get them to finish. So that's what we've invested so much time and money into with our second chance dollar because I don't have to worry about you no more if I can get you in that CDL truck and you can successfully get on the road. So you no problem. So you're really looking at the use of the second chance funds um, kind of an, in a return on, on the investment sort of way. Uh, yeah, and, and, you're, an and, you're, and you're being very targeted in the district about how you're, how you're going to use those funds. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, it's not, as you say, it's the small thing. So using the funds to, to if the person's got a, a job where they're going to need the tools but they don't have the money to buy the tools, using the f- funds to help mm-hmm. them – purchase the tools so that they can do the job, uh, to, 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 to use the funds to pay for a CDL uh, mm-hmm. training course, you know, so that they can right. get their licensure and then have a, 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 a very a, a decent paying job with benefits. Uh, right. And, the, and, the, and you, you end up with somebody like the gentleman you described before who was in Florida and doing quite well. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the, it, it was interesting, though, is that you all have taken this sort of very strategic, targeted approach to the use of these funds, and you're doing it in a way to get people to the point where they will have an opportunity to succeed and then sort of work while they're on supervision, uh, work with the their PO, you know, so that the PO can then use the core correctional practices in a way that will address whatever dynamic risk factors they may be presenting with. Exactly. Yeah. Because our objective is not to see you again. Right. I'm just, you know, I'm just, in a nutshell, I don't want to see you four or five years from now or two years from now and I, and I, or I retire and you're still on supervision. The objective is to get you moving in a whole other direction and to get you into that mainstream society. Because, you know, guys function on the margins of society. They're only limited to, to the welfare system, uh, the supervision systems. They li- they they limit it to these systems. Mm-hmm. But once they get out there in the mainstream segment of society, they realize they don't have any limits. You know, they realize all of a sudden their signature will get them a car as opposed to going to a buy her pay her and paying a hundred dollars a week for a car that's twenty years old. Now they see more and they have more opportunities for themselves. Once they get more opportunities they're at least likely to recidivate. Mm-hmm. Well, there, and you use the magic term. I mean, we, there's all this talk about, you know, reducing recidivism, right? I mean, mm-hmm. not just in our system, but across the country and in criminal justice reform circles generally, that's, that's you know, the goal of uh, post-conviction supervision and of the criminal justice system, at least part, part, part of that system is to reduce recidivism. But the way that you're talking about it is in a very real way. And, and you know, it's okay to have... Um, evidence-based programs, but you got to be able to get folks to the point where they can really take advantage of those evidence-based programs. Uh, and, and so I think the work that you're doing in that sense uh, within the probation department in, uh, in Missouri Eastern is really about getting folks to that point where they can succeed. Uh, and where you won't see them again in the future. And, you know, with the higher-risk folks, we know that there's a good chance that, that we may see them again. But then going back to the point you made earlier in our conversation, it's like you got to work with them. you got to expect yeah. them to fail, you know. Exactly. Uh, and they may fail s- several times. Um, but mm-hmm. if, if, the, if the support is there, uh, then uh, – and, and the, the, the tools that you're using are – have been shown to work and are effective, then there's a really good chance that uh, sooner rather than later uh, they will succeed. Right, and then you got to look at the, uh, and then you got to be careful on how you measure. And what I mean by that is that you're a high-functioning individual. My expectation of you is you're supposed to have a master's degree. You're supposed to be teaching somewhere at Harvard or somewhere like that. That's my expectation of you. But I can't have that same expectation or someone who can barely read and write, or someone who got mental health issues, someone who has substance abuse issues. My expectation of them is what they bring to the table. So your success, if you successfully success stop using drugs and you're working at Chick-fil-A, that's a success to me because you're not using, you're working, and it's not much, but you're out of trouble and you're not recidivating. You know, a young woman, uh, uh, some people would think she's successful because she, I called her 
called, she came to mind, I said, and, and her, uh, the Bureau of Prison wanted to know who do we have that was successful on supervision. So I called her because she came to mind. She did the cognitive group with us. And I said, how you doing? She said, I'm doing great. I just bought a car. I'm working at Bedon- Domino's. I'm, right now I'm a shift manager. They're hoping to make me a manager one day. Now, to the average person, it's Domino's. You know, but it's more than that to her because now she can take care of herself in a way that she hasn't been able to do it before, and she's drug free. Now, do you want her? You want to push her further and say, "Nah, that's not good enough. You need to go take this training, or you need to go and get this uh, education here because Domino's is not going to do it for you. It's not. It's not sustaining. Now you just crack your shell." Well, I think that really says it all. Uh, now, before you go, Clark, I want to ask you this. What would be your one professional wish if you had access to unlimited funding to do your work? I would like to do it for better, like the state of Missouri does. They have probation officers that are designated to each uh, state facility. And I'd like to, uh, to have a probation officer at the federal level stationed in those facilities and take on some of those responsibilities that the case managers do. reason why? Because things fall through the cracks. And also give a guy, let that collaborative relationship with a probation officer take place early on rather than later. Because I think if it take, the sooner it takes place, the less fear there is that they have a probation officer that's one. And it's least likely for that relationship to be adversarial, where it's just a cops and robber relationship. It's much more than that. Well, Clark Porter, thank you so much for talking with me. Not no problem. My guest has been Clark Porter, a social worker and community resources specialist with the U.S. Probation Office in the Eastern District of Missouri. If you're interested in learning more about the cutting-edge work Clark and his colleagues in St. Louis are doing, just visit the Probation Office's website at www.moed.uscourts.gov slash probation. Off Paper is produced by Jennifer Richter. The program is directed by Chris Murray. And don't forget, folks, you can subscribe to Off Paper wherever you get your podcasts, and you can stream all episodes of the program from either fjc.gov or the uscourts.gov YouTube channel. I'm Mark Sherman. Thanks for listening. See you next time.